It is really good to be back with you guys uh, this weekend. I missed you last weekend. I always miss you when I'm away. I am at that point in life where I have made my bucket list, and I'm in pursuit of it because I figure your hair turns gray, then it turns loose, and then you, you turn dead. That, I mean, that's kind of the, the order. And uh, so there are a few things I've always wanted to do in my life. And I, I told you I grew up, I grew up very, very poor. We grew up a very poor family. And, and now we're to the point and our kids are out of college and they're adults. And I told you, when your kids get out of college, it's like winning the lottery. All of a sudden, you have money you didn't know you had before. And so I kind of have my bucket list. And one of the things I've always wanted to do was go to Auburn University and see a, a college football game. I just, I watch it on TV. I see the atmosphere. I see that eagle soaring around. Those people going war eagle. And so last Saturday night, I had my beautiful bride in a mo- micro tail in Opelika, Alabama. I'm telling you, it doesn't get any better than that. She's still not speaking to me. And, uh, <laughs> and we were able to go to the game last Saturday night. It was a disaster of a game. Auburn was behind 42 to 7 at halftime. In fact, we left at halftime. But the cool thing is, is right before they start, they let this eagle out, this beautiful bald eagle. And he soars around the stadium and everybody goes, oh, and then it dives down in the middle at the 50 yard line, takes the bait and everybody goes, war, eagle. And it's incredible. So on this night, the night I'm there, the eagle comes out, takes about a half a lap around the stadium and leaves. (laughs) Flies right out of the stadium. That should have been a sign, right? (laughs) Thankfully, he he came around, he felt bad. He came back, did his law and, you know, boom. And and we were all excited about that. But, uh, it is good to be back with you guys uh, this weekend. I did miss you. Uh, it's hard to believe that we're coming to the end of 2012. And as a ministry staff and leadership team, we're gearing up for 2013. And I think the thing, without a doubt, that I'm most excited about as we're ge- gearing up for next year is uh, the relaunching, the reorganizing, restructuring, and relaunching of our small group ministry uh, here at Hope. We, we're going to change, go through that transition between being a church that just has small groups to literally being a church of small groups. And I'm excited because I think one of the toughest things about being a large church, and we are, I mean, we have three campuses. Every one of them will be packed this weekend. And, and one of the, the toughest things about being a large church is that it, it's, really, it's really hard to get connected to other people in community. It's really hard to build not just surface relationships. Oh, I recognize them. I saw them at church. But I'm talking about deep below the surface relationships. And I mean, I understand people attend, they like hope, they like the music, they like the kids' programs, they love all those things. Uh, They attend, maybe they even participate a little bit, but I'm just telling you because of the way God has wired us, that's not enough. God built each of us, he designed each of us to be in community with one another, to be in deep relationships with one another. We want to relate, we want to connect with other people. It's one of our goals here at Hope. Uh, It is part of our DNA, it's how we are wired, it's the way God made us. And I really believe that connecting in a small group community is is the solution uh, to this relational need. And I think it's the solution, uh, the solution for several reasons. First of all, it allows eight to 12 people to get together on a regular basis so that real relationships can form. Again, not just surface how you doing, how's the weather, but what's really going on in your life kind of relationships. Uh, Second, I believe that a small group environment is the most effective environment for us to grow spiritually. It's kind of like the catalyst for spiritual growth. I don't know if you're aware of the statistic, but I'm gonna speak uh, for about 30 or 40 minutes this morning, and then you're gonna forget 90% of what I have to say in the next two hours. By the way, that hurts my feelings. You should know that. But it's the statistics. You're going to forget it. But what if you could get together every week after a message, because they're going to be sermon-based, and we're going to write four or five questions where you could get together in someone's home with eight, 12 of your closest friends and talk about what we just discussed on the weekend. Maybe get clarity uh, where, you, where you didn't understand something. Maybe there's an area that you think we can go deeper, you'd like to go deeper in and ask deeper questions. Uh, you can apply it. In fact, now that you're building these below the surface relationships, you can actually ask someone to hold you accountable maybe for a specific area of your life. And then the third reason I'm excited is I believe that having small groups, uh, being a church of small groups is going to allow us to more effectively impact and serve our community. I mean, take away our small groups that we have now. We basically have three impact points in the triangle. We're, we're all about reaching the triangle, changing the world. We have Raleigh, we have Holly Springs, and we have the West Cary area. But, so we have three points of impact. But if we have hundreds of small groups that are meeting throughout the triangle in homes throughout the week, we have hundreds of points of impact. 
And now all of a sudden, we become the solution in our own communities. For example, I live in Abington in Apex, the peak of good living, right? And so it, when my small group is meeting and we hear of a need on our street, a family that's going through a tough time or maybe two blocks over, it's no longer let's call the church and see what the church can do. We will sit around as a small group and say, what can we do? How can we be a part of the solution? Now, our goal is to launch several hundred, to relaunch several hundred small groups by, uh, by, by February and to get us in the right mode, the state of mind, Come January, I'm going to be doing a series about why connecting with others, why being in community is such a crucial part of our Christian journey. But here's the thing. Between now and then, we need to train several hundred small group leaders and facilitators. And uh, right now, we already have 150 that have gone through the training. And let me just say, uh, you don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to be a great teacher. In fact, if you're a good teacher, you may not even be a, a good small group leader because you're going to run, run your mouth all the time, and that's not what small groups are all about. Uh, you, don't have to be, you don't have to know everything and be able to answer every question. You, you, you kind of have to just like people. You kind of love God and you love people. And if that describes you, you may be the person that we're looking for. And we're not just going to throw you out there and say, God, speed, good luck. Uh, we have several training sessions. In fact, uh, they're coming up seven orientations to choose from between the 10th and December 6th. You can go to the website. You can find out. What, even if you don't know if this is something you would be interested in, this is about an hour. We'll do some vision casting. We're going to train you how to actually lead and facilitate a small group. And I'm just telling you, most of you can do this. In fact, this is what I want to encourage a lot of you to do. A lot of you, you've been in a small group together for a long time, and you kind of lost the passion. You know, uh, my sister's small group, don't tell her I said this, but I think all they do is go out to eat now, right? So don't tell her I said that, but, uh, although she might be here. I didn't think about that. But, uh, uh, you know, maybe it's, just, maybe it's time for a group because now you've all been in it. You all get it. Maybe it's time to blow up that small group and say, you know what? All of us ought to become leaders of people who've never been in a small group because we get it. So I'm going to challenge you to do this. You're going to be hearing more and more about it over the next few weeks as we move toward that February launch. And if you're looking to connect and be in community and build relationships, stay tuned because we're gonna make sure you have the opportunity to do that. My dream would be every, see so we already have small groups for children. We already have them in our middle school, already have them in our high school and many of our adults. But what if all of our adults got involved? You see how it could change our life and change our church. So anyway, uh, so not only are we wrapping up the year, we're wrapping up the series that we've been in for the last nine weeks. We've called it The Great Paradox, Finding Happiness in the Strangest Place places and if you're here for the first time this is a series that we've based on the Beatitudes over in Matthew chapter 5 most of us whether we've been to church much or not we're kind of familiar with the Beatitudes Jesus is blessed are the poor in spirit blessed are the, those who mourn blessed are those who are meek and what we learned the very first week is this word blessed really means happy it means happy it's actually the Greek word makarios the root of the word is car it means joy so Jesus says you will find true happiness this isn't happiness that's based on external circumstances this isn't happiness as if your marriage happens to be going great right now or you have enough money right now to pay the bills or your kids are doing okay right now because of all those things are lining up now I'm happy we're not talking about that kind of happiness we're talking about an inner happiness that is only possible when we have a relationship with Jesus Christ and he begins that process of transforming us into the image that he created us to be. Remember, it's not the do attitudes, it's the be attitudes. We become poor in spirit, we become mournful, we become meek, we, be, we have this hunger and thirst for righteousness to be in a right standing with God. And that's where you will find real happiness, but it's some strange places compared to what society says, this is where you'll find happiness. By the way, just so you know, According to statistics, America is the saddest nation on the planet. Uh, they rank all the countries. Uh, this is what some, some statistics that Sarah, my assistant, came up with. Over 40 million Americans are on antidepressants. Get this now. Guess what the fastest growing market is for antidepressants? Preschoolers. Preschoolers are the fastest growing category of depressed people. Over a million preschoolers in America have been diagnosed as clinically depressed. Hear about suicide, the third leading cause of death among people between the ages of 15 and 24. The second leading cause of death among college students. We'll spend 44 to $55 billion this year on depression. It is the second leading cause of disability in our country. So those statistics tell us there's more depression, there's more suicide, there's more pills in America than any other nation on the planet. I mean, doesn't that make you proud? But what really should make us depressed is that right here in Matthew chapter five, Jesus says, I'm giving you the secret to happiness. 
I'm giving you the recipe for happiness, and it doesn't really depend on your circumstances. It doesn't matter what's going on. Even when you're going through a really tough time, I'm telling you, you can be happy. By the way, if you're here this weekend and you're not a Christian, you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, I'm just going to kind of tell you ahead of time, you're just kind of listening in, looking over our shoulder today. Uh, this really isn't so much for you. And in fact, after you hear what I have to say over the next few minutes, you may think, man, I am so glad I never made that decision to become a Christian. I mean, but, but it may do this. You may sit here this weekend and think, you know, as I think about it, my life really doesn't have a whole lot of purpose. My life doesn't really have a whole lot of direction. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of meaning to my life. There's just kind of an emptiness to my life. I get up, I do my job, I go through marriage, I go to bed, I do it again the next day, but without really knowing why, what we're going to talk about over the next few minutes, what you're going to learn is, is that Christianity is not only a life worth living, it's also a life that is worth suffering and even being persecuted for living. Now, we've come to our eighth and final beatitude, and I met several guests today, and I said, I'm sorry you came this week. This is a tough one. Uh, it's, it's hard to make being persecuted fun, okay? But let's look at the beatitude, Matthew 5, verse 10. And of all the beatitudes, this, mo this may be the most paradoxical. Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. The word righteousness means because you have a right standing with God. Before Jesus, you didn't. You were alienated from God. But because Jesus, now you, you, can, you can be reconciled back to God through what he did on the cross and his resurrection. You now can have a relationship with God, and God has called you to live by a different standard. You, you, you march to the beat of a different drum. You now have a right standing with God. So Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted because they have a right standing before God, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus says, let's take this a little bit further. Blessed are you when people insult you persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me rejoice and be glad literally that phrase means jump for joy because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you now let me just point this out although this is the very beginning of Jesus's ministry for 30 years he was a carpenter at the age of 30 he goes public with his ministry for about three years although this is at the very beginning of Jesus's public ministry understand he's already made it onto the religious leaders blacklist okay they've been following around they've been snooping they've already picked up on the fact that Jesus wasn't following their rules he wasn't following their regulations he wasn't jumping through their hoops they had already concluded this is a guy who's gonna color outside the lines and they had already begun to hate him. In fact, they've set their sights on him. So Jesus, as he's sitting on the, uh, on, on the Mount of Olives, as he's given the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is already aware of the fact that suffering is going to be a part of his future. Persecution is going to be a part of his future, right? The disciples that are new at following him, they don't know that yet. They don't know what they signed up for. So Jesus says to the disciples, understand, both then and now, in other words, those that were sitting there listening that day, those of us this weekend who now identify ourselves as disciples or followers of Jesus Christ, this is what he's saying. He said, I just want to give you a heads up. just want to give you a heads up. Full disclosure. I want you to know, if you choose to follow me, you're going to suffer persecution. And I know what some of you are thinking about now. You're thinking, wow, Mike's up to something persecution must mean something totally different in the Greek. And any second now, Mike's going to enlighten us with his vast knowledge of the Greek language because I don't see how in the world you can suffer persecution and be happy at the same time. So as not to disappoint you, let me give you the definition of this Greek word, persecuted, it means this. To put someone to flight, to drive away, to pursue in a hostile manner, to harass, to trouble, to mistreat. Was that more encouraging? Let me give it to you one more time. To put someone to flight, to drive away, to pursue in a hostile manner, to harass, to trouble, to mistreat. This is what Jesus is saying. If you're listening, fasten your seatbelt. Tough times are coming. Rough waters ahead. It happened to the prophets who were here before me. It's going to happen to me, and it's also going to happen to anyone who chooses to be my disciple, who chooses to follow me, you will suffer persecution. Let me give you a couple of other verses. 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. Paul is writing from prison to young Timothy, and this is what he says in his letter. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Wow. The word uh, uh, everyone there in the Greek, it means everyone. Everyone. Okay? Here, how about this one? Philippians 1.29. For it has been granted to you, this word granted, you know what it means? Given as a gift. So let's read it that way. It has been given as a gift to you on behalf of Christ. 
Not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Jesus has given us the gift of suffering. The opportunity to suffer for him. And we hear that and we think, if those are the kind of gifts that Jesus gives, I do not want him to draw my name at Christmas, right? I mean, with friends like this, who needs enemies? The gift of suffering. But Jesus warns us. He said, I'm just giving you a heads up, full disclosure. If you follow me, you will experience, you will suffer persecution. Now, look at another passage, John 15. Jesus has a little bit more to say on this topic. Let me give you the context uh, John 13, 14, remember we had the upper room discourse. Jesus has got the last few minutes that he's spending with his disciples. When we get to John 15, he's just a few hours from being nailed to the cross. He knows that. The disciples haven't gotten their arms around it yet. So it's as if Jesus speeds up his teaching because he knows that window of opportunity is closing. So this is what he says to the disciples, John 15, beginning in verse 18. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. I've chosen you out of the world. It's interesting, the, the Greek word for church is ekklesia. It means called out ones. So Jesus says, I have called you out of the world. I've called you out to be my church, my chosen people. Then he says this, that is why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. And let's be honest, that's true. I mean, just in case you've been living in a cave over the last few years, let me just bring you up to speed. We now live in a time in our culture where society isn't all that fond of Christians. Have you realized that we are quickly becoming the ones that are losing our rights? We are now the joke of pretty much every sitcom. We're the brunt of the joke, it seems, of every late night comedian. Uh, let's be honest, uh, the political system that we live in pretty much ignores us, it ignores our values. In fact, I will, I will promise you this. If you walk out of church this weekend and you determine that I am going to live a life guided by godly principles, you're going to be considered narrow. You're going to be considered an extremist. You're going to be considered mean. You're going to be considered judgmental. You're going to be considered out of touch, living in the past. You're going to hear things like the, the 50s call. They want their morals back, right? But Jesus says, hey, this shouldn't shock you. I warned you ahead of time, if they hated me, and they did, they're not going to like you a whole lot either. And I know what a lot of you are thinking, because this is kind of how Christians think these days. Some of you are thinking, well, we just need a makeover. We just need to change our image, because society doesn't have the right image of us. We just got to be more loving, and we do need to be more loving. We've got to do a better job at turning the other cheek, and we do need to do a better job of turning the other cheek. We just need to go the extra mile. We need to do, we need to do that. We need to love and accept people where they are. We need to do a better job at that. But you may be thinking, I'm going out of here this weekend, and my mission is to change how society views Christianity. Let me just give you, let you in on a little secret here. You cannot live in a loving enough way as a follower of Jesus Christ not to be persecuted. Let me say that again. You cannot live in a loving enough way as a follower of Jesus Christ not to be persecuted. Do you know how I know that? I know that because when Jesus was on this earth, he was the embodiment of love. And they nailed him to a cross. So I'm just telling you, no matter how much we love people, and no matter how much we turn the other cheek, and no matter how much we go the extra mile, no matter how much we accept people where we are, we are going to be persecuted, and we're going to be persecuted because we have this right standing with God. And when we have a right standing with God, God has called us to live by a different standard. God has called us to march to the beat of a different drum. By the way, let me just point out something here. It doesn't say this, blessed are those who are persecuted because they're unreasonable. It doesn't say that. It's not talking about blessed are you that are persecuted because you're obnoxious or you act stupid as a Christian. This isn't persecution that you bring on yourself because you're a jerk, okay? And let's face it, we're guilty of that sometimes as Christians. One of my favorite bumper stickers in California was this. It said, God may love you, but everybody else thinks you're a, I mean, you'll have to fill in the blank there. I can't, I can't, I can't say it at church. I'm not talking about that kind of persecution. This is persecution that comes when two irreconcilable value systems collide. Well, let me break it down a little further. This is when kingdom living, and I'll call kingdom living, uh, as, as when you decide, I'm gonna live by God's standards, I'm gonna live by his principles, his laws, his values, when kingdom living collides with our culture, with its standards, its principles, its values. It's, it, now, here's the challenge. Here's, here's where it gets 
it's just where it gets interesting. God's standards never change, okay? What God wrote in this book, never going to change. God is the same yesterday, today, forever. There's a, actually, there's a character trait we, that God has. It's called immutability. It means God never changes. God never changes his character. He's never going to change his standard. If, if, it, if it was true in Genesis, it will always be true. It's always a principle that we should live by. Now, here's, here's where the tension is. In our culture, the standard is constantly changing. Now, in a perfect world, what would happen would be our culture would constantly be changing, but it would be changing to be brought into a line with God's standard. No, we live in a culture now that says this, we want God's standard to be brought into line with our culture because we live in a culture that's more concerned not about truth, but about fairness. Now, let me, just, let me just say something here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use you an example, and I want to I say ahead of time, I'm not a hater. Our mission statement here at Hope is love people where they are and encourage them to grow in a relationship with Jesus Christ. We don't want you to stay where you are. We want you to become everything that God has created and called you to be, but we don't want to love you where you are, so I'm not a hater, but let me just say this. Let me use an example here, and it's a touchy one. It's a touchy one. It's this whole issue of marriage. I mean, let's just be honest, for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years, it's pretty clear what marriage was. It was marriage between a man and a woman. That was marriage. In fact, this is what you go all the way back to Genesis 2.24. If anybody ever asks you what's the biblical view of marriage, you have it in Genesis 2.24. God said this, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. That, that's been okay. That stood for thousands of years. But, if, you know, a couple of decades ago, society thought, you know what? That's not fair. That's just not fair. We got to do something about that's not fair. To which I always ask, when did life become all about being fair? You want to you want to you want to see the most unfair person you've ever met in your life? Read the gospels about Jesus. You want to talk about somebody unfair? Go home and read John 5. It says one day Jesus is walking around the pool of Bethesda. This is where dozens maybe hundreds of people laid every day because they were maimed handicapped paralyzed they were blind they had all of these maladies and one day Jesus is walking through and he picks out one man and this is what he says hey you want to be healed mm -hmm. you know what everybody was thinking hey what about the rest of us mm -mm, nope just you just you well that's not fair how about this there were a lot of days people showed up and jesus fed them the next day they showed up jesus didn't feed them that's not fair that's that's just sending a wrong message right now here's the challenge and i know i'm on shaky ground this morning I know, go ahead and send me your emails i'll give them to you i'll give you my address in a second but i'm just this is why you don't want me to have a week off i get all worked up okay <laughs> we have become so consumed with fairness in our culture we have been forced to become so politically correct in our culture, if you take a stand against anything, if you have any values or morals, you are going to pay a price. I'm just telling you it's a matter of time. Look at what Jesus said in five, uh, Matthew 5. This is right after the Beatitudes, uh, verse 14. Jesus says this, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. And if you've been watching the coverage of Sandy, you know that you've heard stories of people saying, we had at least this one battery-operated light or we had this one candle and how thankful they were that they at least had that kind of light, right? It gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and tell you how great you are. No, it doesn't say that. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. By the way, let me just tell you, that's how you reach the triangle and change the world. I mean, J Jesus gave us the recipe right here. We walk out of here, not armed with great strategies and plans. We walk out of here armed with things like meekness and mercy and purity and peace, all the things we've learned about in the Beatitudes. And we shine light into a dark world. And when we live our lives this way, I'm just telling you, our lives, we can't even help it. Our lives are going to influence the lives of others. Let me give you Webster's definition of influence. It's the act or power of producing an effect without apparent exertion or force or direct exercise of command. Let me give it to you again. The act or power of producing an effect without apparent exertion or force or direct exercise of command. That's how we change the triangle. That's how we reach the triangle. That's how we change the world. Not by trying to force people to follow Jesus Christ. 
Not by trying to force people to live godly lives. Not by trying to legislate morality. You see, we've spent way too much time as Christians trying to clean out the fishbowl and not enough time fishing for men. Right? Not by pursuing a political agenda. Let me just say something about this because we had the election this week. I would say over the last 60, 70 years, slowly the church has lost its influence. Let's go back to Webster's definition. We've surrendered. We've given up our influence in society. And now we want to recapture our influence by using the political system. That was never God's plan. Let me just say something here. I believe everybody should vote. I voted Thursday. It was so cool. Half the people working the polls and half the people in the polls, I think, went to Hope Community Church. Hey, Mike, hey, Mike. Everybody, you know, I thought it was so cool to see everybody voting there, right? I think you should vote. I've already voted because I'm going to be out of town Tuesday, so I've already voted. And I know a lot of people have been emailing, when are you going to say anything about the election? When are you going to say something about the election? So let me say something about the election. I hope you vote. You, you should vote. You should vote. And I'm just so obnoxious, I made them look at my ID. I wanted to prove, I wanted to look, I want you to know, who, this is me right here. Don't clap, don't clap. I'm just obnoxious. That's why they hate us, okay? Um, but let me tell you, I can't, I, I'm not going to tell you how to vote. You're, you're an adult. You're an adult. And hopefully you're a follower of Jesus Christ. As a follower of Jesus Christ, let me just give you some, some guidelines voting. Don't vote because someone's black. Don't vote a certain way because someone's white. Don't vote on just the economy. Don't vote solely on what is in your best interest. Don't even vote your conscience. I think as a child of God, we vote biblical principles. Now, it, sometimes it's tough. It's like the lesser of two evils, you know what I'm saying? But we do the best we can, and you pray, God, give me the wisdom to vote for the right person. Now, let me just say this. By the way, I have a blog that's going to be up on Monday. It's called, is Jesus, Was Jesus a, a, a Republican or a Democrat? I don't have a clue, but I thought it was a catchy title. And, and, I, and I look at a few principles that Paul gives us in Romans, because you know what Paul says, whoever God puts in authority over you, you respect them because God allowed them to be in authority over you. And I always like to remind people, you know who was in authority over Paul? Nero, who was burning Christians at the stake when Paul wrote that. So be careful about how you react and respond and what you say on Facebook and those kinds of things. Because here's the reality. I'm going to be in Dallas this week for a meeting. I'm going to wake up Wednesday morning. It's not going to matter who's the new president of the United States. You know why? Because God will still be on the throne, and I will still be a citizen of a hurting, messed up world, and I have very simple marching orders. Influence them with the name of Jesus Christ. Now, that's how you change the world. We live out what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, just so you know, when you decide to live that way, you are going to pay a price because darkness always doesn't appreciate light. In fact, let me give you a statement to remember. In order to make a difference in the world, you have to be different. And we don't always like that. We want to be accepted. We want love. We want everybody to like us. If you want to make a difference in the world, you're going to have to be different. For that reason, God has called us to live a different way. He's called us to a different standard. And when we really live life the way God calls us to live life, Jesus says you're going to ruffle some feathers. Don't worry about it when that happens. Don't pout. Don't act like you're a martyr. Don't walk around saying, woe is me. He says, in, in fact, in Matthew 5, 12, rejoice and be glad. Jump for joy because ultimately you're going to be rewarded for doing the right thing. And when you're rewarded for doing the right thing, you're going to realize I must be right where God wants me. Therefore, I can be happy even when it's tough. Matthew 5.10, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. And here's the promise, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. By the way, Jesus said he would be persecuted. Was he? Beaten within an inch of his life and nailed to a cross? Okay. How about the disciples? They followed, were they persecuted? Well, let me just tell you, Matthew, this is based on history. Matthew was martyred in Ethiopia from a sword wound. Mark died in Egypt after being drugged by horses through the city streets of Alexandria until he was pronounced dead. Luke was hanged in Greece for preaching. Peter was crucified upside down. James, the half-brother of Jesus, was thrown off the pinnacle of the temple. He fell 100 feet. Somehow he survived, and they clubbed him to death. 
James, the son of Zebedee, was beheaded in Jerusalem. Uh, Nathaniel was a missionary to Asia, now Turkey. He was flayed to death by a whip for preaching the gospel. Andrew was crucified after being whipped by seven soldiers. He hung on, he died two days later. Thomas was stabbed to death with a spear while preaching in India. Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, was killed with arrows when he wouldn't deny his faith. Matthias, remember Matthias? He became the apostle after Judas killed himself. He was stoned and beheaded. Paul was tortured, then beheaded by Emperor Nero. The only one not martyred was John. John was boiled in oil, and it didn't kill him. So they banished him to the Isle of Patmos. It freaked him out when he didn't die. Hmm. Hey, did you realize we wouldn't even have one of these? If men and women hadn't been willing to die and be persecuted to make it possible. You ever heard the name William Tyndall? You may have it on your Bible. You probably have a book with his name on the binder. He lived in the 16th century. When he was alive, the only Bibles that were available were Bibles that were written in Latin. The only people that had them were the Catholic priest. And the Catholic Church didn't want the common person, the average person on the street, to have a Bible. They thought all they really need is the law of the Pope. So the Catholic Church didn't want them to have an English copy of the Bible. Tyndall was a Protestant. He was part of the Reformation. He had a vision that every person, every common person, could have a Bible that they could read in the English language. So you know what he did? He went through the process of learning Greek. My heart goes out to him. He learned Greek, and he translated the Bible from Greek into English. Now, when it was discovered by the Catholic Church what he was up to, he was charged as a heretic. He had to flee to Germany. While he was in Germany, he finished the New Testament and he decided to learn Hebrew. I'm telling you, Greek is a day in the park, a walk in the park compared to Hebrew. He learned Hebrew and he translated the first five books of the Old Testament. But before they, he could finish the entire Old Testament, the church found him. They imprisoned him in Brussels for 16 months. On October 16, 1536, he was taken to the place of execution. He was tied to a stake. He was asked to renounce his faith. He said no. They strangled him and burned him at the stake. John Rogers, a Hebrew scholar, he knew what Tyndall had been up to. So he, he took up what Tyndall had not finished, and he translated the rest of the Bible from the Hebrew into English. If you know your history about this time, Henry VIII, some of it. You know Henry VIII? I'm Henry VIII, that, not that, that, that guy, that's the guy. Henry VIII was on the throne of England, right? And it was kind of screwed up why he pulled away from the Catholic Church. Remember, they wouldn't grant him his divorce, but God even used that messy situation. He started the Church of England, declared himself head of the Church of England. While he was on the throne of England, he actually encouraged the translation of the Bible into English. In 1553, Henry VIII died. His daughter, Catherine I, Queen, I mean Queen Mary I, took the throne. Uh, we know her as Bloody Mary. She hated Protestantism. She always hated the fact that her father had broken away from the Roman Catholic Church and her desire was to return England back to Catholicism. She only reigned five years. In five years, she literally martyred hundreds of men and women. Many were Bible translators. It's where we get the term Bloody Mary. But there was one person she really wanted to kill and it was John Rogers. She couldn't find him. She put out a search for him. She finally found him in Geneva. He had just finished translating the Old Testament. She brought him back to England. She had him tried as a heretic, declared guilty. They tied him to a stake. They gave him one last chance to renounce his faith. His wife and children were in the crowd that day. And when they said, John Rogers, will you renounce your faith? Before he could even respond, his 10-year-old son yelled out from the crowd, don't do it, Dad. And they burned him at the stake. Hmm. This is the question that I've really been, this week. As a follower of Jesus Christ, would, would you suffer persecution for what you believe? Now, I, I, I'm not a prophet of doom, and I don't know what God's plans are for our country or the world. I don't know that stuff. But I see trends, and I, I wonder if, if the world keeps going the direction it's going, if we are not maybe going to get a chance to find that out. Right? But here's the good news. Jesus says, happy are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, because they have a right standing with God, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What a reward. 
theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's bow, and uh, as we wrap this up, let's, let's pray together. Let me ask you something as we're getting ready to close. Are you happy? I mean, really happy? Or have you just kind of tried to do life your own way? You thought, well, if I could get enough money, I'd be happy, and that hasn't worked. Or if I could get that right corner office, I'd be happy, or that doesn't work. Or if I could be recognized, I would be happy, and you're recognized, but that hasn't worked. Or if I could get married, if I could have kids, if I could live here, if I could drive this. And you'd be honest enough to say, man, I'm, I'm just, I don't have this kind of happiness. I think what, this is what Jesus wants us to understand as we wrap up this series. Hello, I've already paid for your happiness. And this is all I want in return. I'm not interested in your money. I'm not interested in your time. I'm not even interested in how often you read my word. This is what, let's just start here. What I want in return is you. Everything else will work out. I'm going to take you on as a project, and I'm not going to give up on you until it's completed. We'll worry about those, but right now what I want is you. You. I want you just to surrender your life to me. And, and you, when you think about it, you know, it's kind of a small price to pay when you think of the price that was paid so that we could have this relationship with God. Father, I just, I pray right now. Make sure this morning we understand the main thing is the main thing. It's not the election. It's not the main thing. I mean, you sit on the throne of the universe. You direct the hearts of kings like water that flows through a channel. Nothing's going to escape you. Everything is on your timetable. The real issue is, do I have this kind of faith where even if I was persecuted for what I believe, I think of a man who lost his job because he wouldn't take his clients to a strip club any longer. Would I be willing to make that kind of stand if I had to? Father, we just want to be used by you. We want to, we want to be difference makers. We want to influence the world for you. Help us to be salt. Help us to be light. In your name we pray. Amen.